Hey everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. The video you're about to watch is a production from our ministry. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, we have different pastors, teachers from different churches and denominations coming on the show to discuss a wide range of theological topics. Many of our guests we agree with and many of our de guests we disagree with, but our goal is to understand God's word so that we can then understand the God who has given us his word. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We we hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this video and want to continue to help us produce content like this, we'd ask that you go down into the description of the video and donate. There's a, a description link there in the video, and it would help us continue producing content just like this. Be blessed. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We are talking about uh, bearing God's name, uh, often what is uh, viewed as one of the commandments of taking the Lord's name in vain. And we're here with Carmen uh, Imes on the other side of this line. We're going to be dialoguing about that with her in her new book. Before we dialogue about that, uh, I'd love to introduce our co-host today in studio. We've got Michael Roundtree. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. This is a good read, right? It's a good read. This is, yeah. We don't this often is, get like... This is a great book. You guys need to read it. It's called Bearing God's Name. You're going to hear all about it, so you don't need me to explain it right now. But uh, sure. anyway, but this uh, this is incredible. Yeah. So uh, coronavirus, you guys surviving? Uh, we're surviving. You know, it's kind of interesting. I almost feel like, because we're doing these shows like all the time, we're on corona schedule now. Right. And so I, I feel like, no, there's nothing new. Just staying in quarantine, pretty much the same yeah. It's a little disorienting. It's, Quarantine it's and podcast. That's very what I do much now. like the other kind of Corona, because <laughs> like the beer. Yeah, because you know, if you if when you have Corona for an extended period of time, life becomes disorienting. So it's very similar, <laughs> uh, very similar in many ways. Uh, and that that's a great introduction. Uh, Carmen, corona jokes. Tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we dive into the topic today. All right. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I am associate professor of Old Testament at Prairie College in Three Hills, Alberta. We are also on lockdown because of Corona, so I'm teaching online, um, but it probably feels a little bit more normal to be in quarantine because we're still getting snow. We're a long ways off from spring. Uh, no flowers here, no no leaves on the trees. <laughs> um, I've been in quarantine teaching, anyway. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I've been teaching at Prairie for three years as my third year. I get to teach all of our Old Testament courses. And before that, I taught for a while at George Fox University and Multnomah University as an adjunct. I did my PhD at Wheaton College in Illinois, my master's in biblical studies at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. And before that, we were missionaries in the Philippines. And before that, I did my undergrad at Multnomah Bible College, now Multnomah University. So there's the, there's the whole deal. Wow. And this this book that we're talking about, and we're talking about the contents, the theological subject matter of this book. Mm -hmm. This is this is the uh, the Reader's Digest version of the dissertation that you wrote. Is that correct? Yeah, that'd be one way to say it. Um, the dissertation is uh, here. It is here. It's called "Bearing Yahweh's Name at Sinai: uh, A Reexamination of the Name Command of the Decalogue." Notice I forgot the title of my own book. Um, that was my doctoral dissertation that I wrote under Dan Block. It's super technical, but all the way through, as I was studying these concepts, I kept thinking the church needs to hear this. This is yeah. really mind-blowing stuff. This is really important stuff. It's everything about who we are as Christians and what we're called to be and do in the world. And so I wanted to rewrite it in a form that the church could could receive and appreciate. And so I wrote it, rewrote it as Bearing God's Name. This is showing up backwards on my screen, but you guys have it no, there. No, we got it. We got it flipped right. You're good. Sweet, yeah. sweet. Um, now, so, Bearing God's Name, Why Sinai Still Matters came out in December. It's published by InterVarsity Press. And it's not the same thing as the dissertation. The dissertation is a deep dive in one verse, really looking at it from every angle. Whereas the, the InterVarsity book is taking that concept of Bearing God's Name and tracing it through the whole canon. So it's it's not the same book, but it's definitely written for a different audience. Gotcha. No, it's it's rich. Uh, like I, I don't when I say Reader's Digest version, I only meant like uh, mm. you don't have to have a PhD to be able to read this book because there are those books that like, and I think of Heiser, and I know that that, that I actually associate you guys together on, on many levels because his work, uh, if, if an academic were to pick it up and read it, uh, yeah. he's got tons and tons of content. It would be enlightening. Yeah. Uh, it would be yeah. educational for them, but it's also yeah. accessible to the layman that doesn't have a PhD. So uh, super thankful for the work. Great read. Loved it. Uh, really good book. Let's let's dive into maybe some of the, the, the main pieces of this. Sure. Why bearing God's name? Uh, why, why is that kind of the focal point of the book? 
Yeah, so my doctoral study was on the command not to take the Lord's name in vain, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. And I had always imagined that that was telling us that we shouldn't swear or use God's name as a swear word, or maybe that we shouldn't um, take an oath in God's name and then break our promise. And I, when I was coming to Wheaton to, to do my PhD, I was in conversations with Dan Block about what I might write about. And he's, I asked him for suggestions and he said, you know, we have this command wrong. It really should be translated, you shall not bear the name of Yahweh your God in vain. And it has nothing to do with speech or we shouldn't limit it to speech. This is actually about how we live far more broadly than that. And I was fascinated, and so I began to investigate, and I decided he's right. This command is not just about the way we speak, but it's about how we live. So the idea is that at Sinai, Yahweh is claiming the Israelites as his own people, as his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. And to do that, he's putting his name on them, like stamping them with his name. And therefore, they need to live in such a way that his name is honored among the nations. So that would be, uh, that would be bearing his name well. The command is the reverse, don't bear my name in vain. So that would be saying I belong to Yahweh, but living as, you know, no differently than any of the neighboring nations. Okay. That's, the, wow. that's the basic basic idea. Now, and specifically, so you mentioned Sinai. So say going back to Abraham, the father of Israel. Okay. So, I mean, you know, I'll make your name great. The Jewish nation begins mm -hmm. its formation in that stage, even if it's not specifically, uh, maybe not quite as codified and set out as what happened in Sinai. Uh, mm -hmm. What specifically was it about Sinai following mm -hmm. the Exodus? What was it so specifically about Sinai that was the game changer in mm -hmm. sort of the telling of Israel's story and the bearing of God's mm -hmm. name? Mm -hmm. Certainly God's promises to Abraham were important, and God does um, make a covenant with Abraham. I don't see the Sinai covenant as a different covenant than the Abrahamic covenant. I think it's a ratification of the Abrahamic covenant with the entire nation. So you notice when Abraham has children, he's got Ishmael and Isaac, but it's only Isaac who is the covenant offspring, the one who's... Um, carrying on the covenant promises. Then Isaac has Jacob and Esau, but it's only Jacob who's chosen. Then Jacob has 12 sons. And this is where I think we get a pivot in the story, because instead of just choosing one of Jacob's sons with whom to carry on the covenant, God is saying, all of your offspring are part of this. And so he brings the entire nation to Sinai. And at that point, of course, they had been slaves in Egypt. He rescues them. And he says, all right, game on. I'm ready to, to fulfill the promises I made to your great, great grandfather, Abraham. I'm going to bring you into the land I promised him. You are the fulfillment of the many descendants he was going to have. And now it's time to begin making you a blessing to all nations. God had told Abraham through you, all nations will be blessed, but that didn't seem to really be happening in Egypt. And so when, as God is bringing his people into the promised land, that's where he's able to begin to fulfill the promises he made to Abraham. But he's at Sinai, he makes it formalized. He gives them the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone, indicating that it's a treaty that they're entering into. He ratifies that covenant through a blood sacrifice and sprinkling them with blood and putting up 12 stones, Exodus 24. So there's a bunch of things that happen at Sinai that seem uh, significant in terms of ritual, like we're putting it into effect. But also the scope is now the entire family, not just one one son. Wow. And you know, one thing I noticed about what you were saying was you, you see a sort of seamlessness between the covenant with Abraham mm -hmm. and with the nation of Israel. Now yeah. that's looking backwards, but what I know about you is you also see a continuity uh, mm -hmm. all the way through to the New Testament times. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think mm -hmm. that's true. Uh, maybe you could speak to how this covenant plays out when you, so you have that covenant made with Abraham, ratified mm -hmm. and codified with the nation of Israel under Moses, and yes. then proceeding forward to David and then the Davidic covenant. So then mm -hmm. you have the new covenant. Can you help us sort of, I, I guess, see the seamlessness of all of that and how it strings sure. together? 
Sure, yeah. The, I would say the Davidic covenant is not the same covenant. <clears throat> it's it's a um, it's just with David, so it has to do with the royal dimension of his you know his reign, and his descendants will continue to reign. So I, I see it sort of as like an appendix, maybe an appendix to the Sinai covenant, that's just with David and his descendants. And then Jeremiah comes along and talks about the new covenant. And one of the maybe more radical things that I suggest in my book is that this is not a new covenant in the sense that God is doing away with the Sinai covenant and he's got a different plan, but that we should think of it as the renewed covenant, that God is taking the covenant he made at Sinai with his people and he's going to breathe new life into it in, at, at some future point. And, and because what I argue is that the, the covenant at Sinai was not the problem. The problem was the heart's the hard hearts of people who fail to obey it. So if you very carefully look at Jeremiah 31, when he says, this covenant is not like the covenant I made with your ancestors, then you look really carefully and it's the thing that's different is their ability to obey it, not the covenant itself. So I see Jeremiah pointing forward into New Testament times, saying that God is going to renew the covenant from Sinai, that he's going to write it on people's hearts. And I do indeed think that that is the covenant that the church is called to be part of, the, mm -hmm. the renewed Sinai covenant, if you will. Yeah, that, that's excellent. So, so you know, in your book, you seem to suggest that the bearing God's name is actually uh, one of the most catalytic um, phrases, commands in which uh, the, mm -hmm. the people of God are to interpret all of the law. So, yeah. so maybe you can help us. What is the law for? What is the purpose of the law when it was given mm -hmm. to the people of Israel? And how should we be looking at it uh, in, in the context uh, of that, that, that truth? Yeah. yeah, great question. I think we, most Christians have a problem when we read Old Testament law, we're looking at it through the wrong set of lenses. We think that the law was given to Israelites as sort of a prerequisite for salvation. Like if you mm -hmm. do these things, then I then I will save you. But in fact, if you read Exodus carefully and you pay attention to where the law appears, God gives it to them at Sinai after he's rescued them out of Egypt. This is not a prerequisite for salvation. It's a gift to people who've already been redeemed, who've already been taken out of op oppression. They've already been told, you are mine, you belong to me. God's entering into a covenant with them. So the law is not Israel's means of salvation. I, I would suggest instead that it's the means of demonstrating his character to a watching world. It's a way of living in an ordered society. He's showing them how to live in freedom, if you will. So the, the first statement in the Ten Commandments is, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves. So whatever the law is, it has to be consistent with, compatible with freedom. It's not a ball and chain. They're not sitting there groaning, thinking, oh, man, really stinks to be an Israelite because we have to do all this stuff. And I wish I was I wish I was, you know, in part of some other culture where they didn't have to do all this stuff. No, they're celebrating that God has made clear the way they're to live. He's bringing order and, and breathing life into their society. That's okay. good. Wow. So, uh, so how would you understand some of the texts in Paul that I think have been used in the, a way that's maybe contrary to, to what you're saying a little bit? I'm not yeah. saying that they say something contrary, but I'm just talking about <laughs> how they're typically discussed. So uh, yeah. whether it be uh, Romans 3.20, where the law is what makes us conscious of sin, or whether it, it be in Galatians, where the law is a tutor that mm -hmm. is meant to kind of point us and lead us toward Christ by showing yeah. us how sinful we are, or yeah, Titus yeah. chapter 1, where it's like the <laughs> law isn't for the righteous people, but for sinners. So I think a lot of Christians, when they look at this, they say, ah, that's what the law for is to tell me how terrible I am mm -hmm. so that I need Jesus. But what mm -hmm. I hear you saying is, well, that's um, maybe not the total, either not the total not picture, picture or not the yeah. picture at all. I, yeah. You're ready to talk. I'm going to let you jump <laughs> in. So, <laughs> Well, I think two, two different things come to mind. One, yes, Paul says some very negative things about the law. He also says positive things that don't get enough airtime. Um, and, and Jesus says very positive things about the law. So one, the first thing that comes to mind is that Paul is not rejecting Sinai per se. What Paul is doing is rejecting the way that Sinai has been misinterpreted and misperceived. So 
people in his day had come to to see the to view the law legalistically they were starting to treat it as a means to salvation and paul saying no this is this is uh this is not what it's about and so he wants to separate people from the law because they're misusing or abusing or misunderstanding it so that's the first thing that comes to mind the other thing is paul is right that the law does show us our sin but i i think where evangelical Christians often go astray in our thinking on this is that we think because the law shows us our sin, therefore the law is bad because it was impossible to ever keep it. But if you read Leviticus 1 through 7, you're reading all these different um, sacrifices that are prescribed for different situations. When someone sins, when a whole community sins, here's what you do. You take this kind of animal, you slaughter it in this way, here's what you do with the blood. And the, the recurring refrain all the way through those chapters is, and they shall be forgiven and they shall be forgiven, and they shall be forgiven. So the law is not like this impossible standard to show everybody they're so screwed up they can't keep it, and then fine, we need a plan B. No, there's already a a built-in way of restoring fellowship that's broken between God and Israel. God doesn't expect them to be perfect. Yes, the law is keepable. It's not it's not an impossible list of, list of things, but he also expects that they're human and they will break laws. And so, yes, the law shows them that they've broken it, but he's already provided a way of repairing that brokenness. Right. So, okay, so then basically two answers. One, he's correcting a misuse of the law. Yes. And uh, and two, uh, it is true that the law does put out there a standard that we're not going to keep, but we're too narrow-minded to make that the only thing that the law was about. Yeah, and I think, again, when Jeremiah addresses the issue of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, he's saying that the problem with the law is that you were hard-hearted, not the problem with the law is it was never keepable or it it, it was bad to begin with. Um, so I think Jeremiah has a positive view of the law. I think Jesus has a positive view of the law. He says, I haven't come to abolish it. I've come to fulfill it. I'm here to do the law. I'm here to carry it out. So we now, you know, we're unable to to, to do it perfectly on our own, but it, we were never expected to do it perfectly on our own. Uh, Jesus comes along and he actually f- perfectly fulfills the law, which in my mind vindicates the law and says this was a good thing from the beginning. So just a follow-up question. We talk about bearing God's name. I loved in your yeah. book when you talked about um, uh, one of the, uh, I could say, proof texts is where, where the, the, the high priest comes mm-hmm. in and he's got all the stones of Israel and their names are written yep. on it. And they're coming before God and, and yeah. the priest is like bearing the name of Israel before the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the law, you, you suggest, is, is just that, that we are yeah. bearing God's name before the world. Uh, we're representing him. I think mm-hmm. this is a great way to talk about who Christ is and that Christ fulfilled mm-hmm. the law, that he yeah. rightly represented the Father he before did. all people. Uh, so I've got a question regarding that. You know, mm-hmm. if Christ is to bear that out and we are to be like Christ, how are we to bear that out? But before I answer, get you a second to answer that question, mm-hmm. I'm going to do a quick word from our sponsor. All right. Are you wanting to start a Christian nonprofit, missions organization, or even a church plant? Do you need help setting up the legal side of your ministry so that you can collect donations biblically and according to state and federal laws? Well, the Fellowship Network is here to serve you. For over 50 years, the Fellowship has provided nonprofit tax covering to hundreds of churches, missionaries, and ministries around the world. They provide the expertise to get you and your ministry on a strong foundation, then place you under the legal covering that allows you to accept tax-deductible donations in the United States. They're not a law firm, but a Christian association that equips uh, ministries like you to do the work God has called you to do. So sign up today at the Fellowship Network. Dot net and use promo code REMNANT to get 10% off your first year of membership. As a matter of fact, we use the Fellowship Network here at Remnant Radio. Uh, they made it fast and easy for us to get started and as a new ministry, and I know they can do the same for you. So sign up at the thefellowshipnetwork.net and get 10% off just for being a listener here at Remnant Radio. Get started online today at thefellowshipnetwork.net. 
to just repeating the question back to make sure, uh, for those who are in, in between uh, that ad there, uh, question being, uh, Christ seems to fully bear God's name uh, and rightly represent him before all people, uh, being fully God and fully man, uh, able to do that, able to yeah. fully represent the Father and make him known. Uh, so how do we as Christians look at the law? Uh, should we should we try to embody it the same way Christ did? Are mm-hmm. there parts of the law that we aren't to follow? How does that flesh out for us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the fifty million dollar question, right? How that's do it, yeah. <laughs> what is the relationship between Christians and the law? Which parts are still valid? Which parts aren't? I think the concept of bearing God's name is really helpful because it gives us an overarching vision for what it is we're even trying to accomplish. So when Jesus comes, he teaches his disciples how to pray. He says, "Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name." I love this line because as I was studying uh, this theme through scripture, it jumped out at me and I realized Jesus is not praying that God would somehow become holy. He's praying that, that God's name, his reputation would be honored, would be consecrated in the way it ought to be. So God is already holy. He doesn't need us to make him holy, but his reputation suffers when we fail to bear his name well. So Jesus is evidently praying by praying this, he's committing himself to making God's name holy, that is mm. to extending his reputation in positive ways in the world. So I think that's our goal. We want to bear God's name with honor in our spheres of influence in whatever ways we can. So the Old Testament law becomes, I think, a tutor for us to show us what are the different areas, what are the different dimensions of my life that need to come under the Lordship of Christ, areas in which I can bring honor to God's name by the way that I live. And it's complex because we're in a different cultural context, but it's even more complex because because of the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the law has been, I I think of the, of Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension as like the prism through which the law then is refracted. And so it's separated out in, in ways that we need to begin to think about which parts of the law are not, are no longer valid in the same way they used to be. So Christ is the once for all sacrifice. So laws related to sacrifice, we don't need to do. He's the temple. He's now our high priest um, mediating between us and God. He's praying on our behalf, interceding for us. So we don't need to do the temple-related things that we used to do. But those passages are still useful to us because they teach us about God's holiness and about ways that he wants to be honored, that we need to be thoughtful in our worship. So it's not like we take a black Sharpie and go through our Bible and cross out all those parts. They still teach us about who God is, but we have to think about how to translate that into our context. So your question was more complex than that. Um, you asked, how do we how do we live it out? So I've, I've suggested that the laws that relate to temple sacrifice we no longer have to do, but which laws do we have to do? Well, I don't have like a list on my wall of these are the ones that still apply and the rest don't. I think each of us in our context need to continue to do the hard work of thinking through, okay, what, why was this law given to ancient Israel and how might I express that in my own context? So I'll give you an example from, from my context, which is snowy Alberta. Um, There's a command in the Torah that that when you build a new house, you need to build a parapet around your roof, which is like a little half wall that makes sure nobody falls off your roof. Now, I've never seen a house in Alberta with a parapet around it, but I'm not going around, you know, shaming my neighbors for not having one because we don't hang out on the tops of our houses here. Our rooftops are not places of socialization like they were for ancient Israel. So in an Israelite context where they had a flat roof, Uh, That half wall was making sure nobody tripped and accidentally fell and died. So what are ways that we might live out the spirit or the principle of that law in our context? Well, we might have we might insist on having railings on our stairs or filling in the potholes in the sidewalk or maybe in in my particular location, shoveling the snow quickly enough so that it doesn't turn to treacherous ice so that people slip and fall on our sidewalk in front of our house. So so I'm not. I'm not building a parapet, but I'm retaining the principle behind that law, which is thinking about 
the well-being of other people who come on my property. And as a homeowner, I need to be conscious of and I'm responsible for other people's well-being. So that's that's just one example of how I would translate an Old Testament law into a uh, current modern day context. Okay, so it sounds like maybe it, you would would you break it down into sort of like the moral, civil, and ceremonial law, where uh, ceremonial is what you described, anything pertaining to sacrifice <laughs> and temple, civil applying specifically to the nation of Israel and their laws for govern, governing a nation, which no longer apply necessarily to, say, the United States of America or yeah. Poland or wherever else. Right, right. But then you have the moral principle behind it all, mm-hmm. which you can kind of see bleeding through a lot of different Old Testament laws, such as the parapet, which you, yep. which you mentioned that there's a, a moral principle behind that, which is essentially, yeah. like Jesus says, the whole thing summed up by love your neighbor yep. and love God. Yep. And, and so find that precept and and mm-hmm. and try to apply it what we're really trying to get at is uh is for our viewers who have tattoos do they need to repent or uh or are they holy or the jumbo shrimp that we talked about last <laughs> yeah. night's episode oh, is God. jumbo shrimp acceptable okay <laughs> i need you well, to say I yes have, i have answers about shrimp and tattoos but let me first say yes i think um I, I think I would tentatively be comfortable separating the laws into ceremonial, moral, and civil. Um, but I would hasten to add that in, in an Old Testament context, people never would have seen it that way. An ancient mm-hmm. Israelite would not have separated things out into those categories. But I do think that refracted through Christ's death and resurrection, that that is kind of the upshot of what we need to do. We need to think about, you know, we're not a theocracy so the civil laws don't apply in the same way. Uh, we don't worship in the temple and do sacrifices anymore, but there are still things we can learn from those categories of law. Yeah, so I've got a question from Jeremiah here. He asked about okay. Acts 15. Yes. And in Acts 15, he says the apostles seem to lay out instructions for Gentiles to follow as they come uh, to saving mm-hmm. faith in Christ. Yep. Uh, could you pull that, that question up for me, uh, Stacy? Yeah, there you go. Um, and and right, so he, he's saying that it doesn't seem as if the Gentiles were required to follow the law, but they, they gave just a few things. I think some uh, say that— Yeah, uh, here, I'll read the verse. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is their conclusion. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, and from blood. Uh, so there's some Old Testament root there. And yep. From what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality— if you keep yourselves from from these, you will do well, farewell. So it's kind of like they're saying, it, like, there are certain things you should take care of here, but maybe not necessarily everything. So Jer- Jeremiah, in, in the comment here, actually says that, so, so it's clear, I think it's, it's clear to him, that mm-hmm. there, there are two different standards, one for Jews and one for Gentiles when they're coming to saving faith in Christ. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I love the question. It's a great question. Um, I'm a big fan of Acts 15. It's a really important part of my own approach to this whole question, um, because I see in Acts 15 the early church wrestling with the question of what do we do with Gentiles? They they want to know now that the gospel seems to be going out more widely, Gentiles are coming to Christ. In fact, the Holy Spirit is falling on them, so that's really confusing because they haven't become Jews first. But the, the Spirit is a sign of covenant membership in the Old Testament. Um, d- places where God talks about pouring out His Spirit, like in Isaiah, that's a sign of covenant renewal. So how is it that Gentiles who aren't covenant members are getting the Spirit without becoming Jews? So they're wrestling with these very questions. And Jeremiah is absolutely right. They are not being told to follow um, all of the Jewish law. Now, specifically, the question they are addressing in Acts 15 is circumcision. The question is, does a Gentile have to become a Jew first in order to follow Jesus? And circumcision is the Jewish sign of the covenant. And the the council concludes that Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. And I think in that moment, this this is a further moment of refraction where the Old Testament law is being we're, we're seeing that there's a strand of Old Testament law that no longer applies in the same way because its sole purpose was to set Israel apart as an ethnic group over against other ethnic groups. And so that would include not just uh, circumcision, but also food laws that were meant to set Israel apart ethnically. And so 
Peter, I mean, the, the whole reason we get to this council in Acts 15 is because of an incident that happened with Peter in Acts 10 and 11, where he's told by the Spirit to go to the home of a Gentile, and he discovers or realizes in that process that God is not calling Gentiles unclean anymore, that because of Christ, they've been clean. And when the Spirit falls on them, he sees that they're covenant members. And what's the crux is for me is in Acts 15, when Peter tells this story to the council about the Spirit falling, and then James, the brother of Jesus, stands up and says in verse 13, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, which is Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. So not only does this relate to the question of Old Testament law, but he's specifically appealing to the idea of Gentiles as people who bear God's name, that Gentiles too can bear God's name. And so, yes, they're not, they're told that they don't need to be circumcised. Um, He points to an Old Testament passage from Amos, which may have seemed pretty obscure, but it was the one place in the Old Testament where Gentiles were said to bear God's name uh, in a future day. You know, it looks ahead to the day when Gentiles who bear God's name would be part of the covenant. So, so yes, Gentiles are given just four instructions. They're supposed to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The best explanation I've heard as to why these four things is that all four of these things relate to pagan worship in that context. Yep. So I know in the Philippines today, one of the Filipino delicacies is to eat um, chunks of pork fat cooked in bl- pork blood. Now, that would be anathema to a Jew or to a Muslim, but many Christians eat it. And I don't think that by doing so, they're violating this particular verse, because even these four instructions that are given in Acts 15 to Gentiles are given to, to Gentiles in that context because it communicates something in that context that may no longer be the case today. Um, we don't. I, I'd like to just briefly yeah. address someone in the comment section. I know Michael has a question. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't know your own name, so I just got to give you by your, your your title here. Kiss the Sun is the username here in YouTube. Nice. Uh, and and Thank you're you. saying like, hey, we're not supposed to follow the law. We don't need to follow the law. We're just for clarity's sake. I think you, yeah. you might have jumped on a little bit later on. Uh, Carmen is actually stating that the law has never, at any point in time, made anyone righteous. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it is not a means to follow the law so that we can have right relationship with God. Yeah. And the comments that that seem to be coming through just for clarity's sake, no one here is saying we should follow the law uh, because it's going to make us righteous. But we we are suggesting that there are standards by which God has given us so that we can rightly represent him. Mm-hmm. I can, uh, uh, you know, I'm married, but I can divorce my wife, get married six other times, not take care of any of the children I have with all of these women. And that would be not rightly representing my God. And mm-hmm. I think anyone uh, within the Christian faith would agree with that. But what we're saying is, the law is helping us give us a clear, uh, clear guideline of how we are to rightly represent God and bear God's name. So, so again, I just want to address some of the people who might be getting a little unnecessarily upset with some of the conversation that we're having. The law does, in fact, show us what is sinful, uh, and and yes, it does expose that. But but we are talking about the deeper meaning of the law as it has been meant throughout history. Yep. Um, good. good clarification, Michael. Yeah. You want to pick up your question? Yeah. Here? No, that's great. Um, well, uh, let's let's go with this one. So, um, in the New Testament, it talks about uh, it talks about law, but it uses some interesting phraseology. Okay. For instance, Galatians six two refers to it as doesn't call it the law of Moses, but the law of Christ. It seems almost to be implicit that there's a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have. Uh, uh, James talks about the, he says this a few times, refers to the law as the law of liberty. And even in that context, he'll quote the Mosaic law, but then call it the, the law of liberty, the law mm-hmm. that gives freedom. Mm-hmm. Or Paul in Romans 8, where he refers to it as the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus, contrasting it with the law of sin and of death. And mm-hmm. so what did, is there some kind of inherent change to the law itself? What I hear you saying is that it's not the law that changed. Mm -hmm. It's really more God's work in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, But could you just speak to that? What, what is meant by this new Testament phraseology that seems to emphasize spirit, life, and freedom in the context of law? 
Yes, um, I, I love the question for two reasons, or two, two maybe two things come to mind. I've already mentioned that the beginning of the Ten Commandments also emphasizes liberty, right? I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of Amen. slaves. So the, the law itself at Sinai is being conceived of as a law of liberty. And so I think there could be some... Um, re- reference back to that by these New Testament authors that they are they are reconceiving of the law in light of Christ as a law of liberty. This is how we are to live in freedom. Christ has set us free. He, God doesn't set His people free in Exodus and then tell them, "Hey, do what do do you do you be my slave, <laughs> do whatever yeah, you okay, want." So. I mean, He's He says He sets them free and then says, "Now here's what it looks like to live as my people." It's not just a free for all. There needs to be order and um, and thoughtfulness to it. And I think Jesus rightly summarizes it by saying, "Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself." Those two things do sum up the law. If we were doing those two things, we wouldn't need all the specifics. But the law gives us the specifics, specific examples of ways to live that out. Um, the, the other thing that came to mind with your question about the law of Christ is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, What's really interesting about the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus continues to say, you've heard that it was said, so I'm in Matthew chapter Mm five, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry will be subject to judgment. Some people have thought that Jesus is like raising the bar on the Old Testament and showing that showing the Pharisees that they that they're not perfect enough or something. I think he's raising the bar on the Pharisaical interpretation of the Sinai law, but I think he's actually bringing us back to the the original intent of the law. I agree. The law was never so meant to be like super narrow in its application. It's meant to be generative. It's meant to mm-hmm. to teach us wise ways of living in God's world. So I don't think like it used to be okay for you to be angry with your brother and call them a fool. And now it's not okay because Jesus just raised the bar. The reason I think that, so so Jesus is saying, you've heard that it was said. I think he's referring to in his own day, Jewish religious leaders are defining the law in these particular ways. And he's saying, let's go back to Sinai and see what it really means. And he's seeing at Sinai that it's a heart issue. The law has always been a heart issue. And here's my proof of that. In Exodus 20, verse 17, part of the Ten Commandments, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What is coveting your neighbor's house but a heart issue, right? You you don't, the coveting is before you've even acted on it. If we're talking about stealing your neighbor's house, there's already a command about that. You shall not steal. Uh, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. This isn't just like referring to adultery. There's already a command against adultery. This is saying even the heart behind it, even the wanting of what God hasn't given you, that's problematic. And so I think Jesus is now reading all of the law through that command not to covet and saying it's always been a heart issue. It's always been more than just murder. It's also hatred. It's always been more than just adultery. It's also lust. Okay. So I don't know, I don't uh, know if that's a helpful way of reframing it. Yeah. No, it, it does resonate. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, uh, for one, part of the reason it resonates, because I, I, I guess in my college days, I remember memorizing Proverbs uh, chapter six, where it would talk about, do not lust in your heart after her beauty and do not let her captivate you with her eyes. Uh, speaking, uh, speaking of just Jesus, uh, this is Solomon saying something (laughs) that Jesus later says. And I heard all the preachers say, well, Hey, Jesus has taken it to the heart, but the old Testament didn't. I remember thinking, well, Solomon kind (laughs) of did take it there. So I I'm tracking with you. But mm-hmm. I'm going to just offer some pushback because I, I know some of our listeners will have some pushback in their sure. in their minds. So I want to maybe offer them a little bit of voice. OK, All so right. um, so let's imagine I'm, I'm objecting here. OK, uh, Carmen, but uh, in Matthew, chapter five, Jesus, he goes up on the mountain to deliver this law 
just like mm-hmm. Moses delivers the law on Mount Sinai, and it seems like this sort of new law, and you, as you keep saying, he, he, he keeps coming back to, you've heard that it was said, you've heard that it was said, and while some of it he might be sort of correcting their misinterpretation, it seems like for some of them he maybe is adding an actual new standard, such as uh, when it comes to oaths, uh, you know, uh, he says, if you've heard that it was said that those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or earth, for it is his footstool, or Jerusalem. Um, but don't take a... Uh, anyway, so he goes on, just basically, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And so, imaginary objectioner saying, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know where it says in the Old Testament to say, don't take an oath at all. It kind of gives you a strategy for how to take an oath, rather. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably possible to say in this case that Jesus is extending it, like maybe maybe in response to abuses that he's seeing in his own day. The, the law about divorce is another example. Moses gives the certain parameters for here's how a divorce is to be enacted. But when he said that, Moses isn't thinking, and by the way, I recommend this. This is a great course of action. No, right. he's He's giving this as a way of protecting the vulnerable from being taken advantage of, making it so you can't just like divorce your wife every other day and then keep taking her back and and be abusive. He's saying this is the proper procedure if your marriage comes to the point of no return. And Jesus Jesus acknowledges this by saying this this is about hard heartedness. Um, I I would say you mentioned Michael that uh, that Jesus goes up on a mountain to give this sermon and I would say yes Jesus goes up on a mountain yes he's referring to the Sinai law but there's a key difference here this is another place where what I say in the book might be a bit radical for some I do not think that Jesus is a new Moses mm-hmm. I do not think that Jesus I'm gonna say it again. I do not think that Jesus is a new Moses. Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. Moses never gives any law by saying, I tell you. He's always passing on to the people what Yahweh said to him on the mountain, and he is just the delivery boy. Hmm. When Jesus goes up on the mountain, he consistently says, I tell you this. And what's shocking to all of his listeners is that he teaches with authority, not yeah, like their that. own teachers. And so I don't think we're supposed to read this and think, oh, it's Moses again. I think we're supposed to think, whoa, Yahweh himself has come to, to teach us I, what the law is really about. I love that point because he's not writing as a scribe or a Pharisee, someone who is copying what has been written or right. uh, is adding commentary on what is being written. He's actually writing yeah. as the author authority. Yeah. Like he's, he's saying, Hey, this is what this meant. And you guys have yep. missed it the whole time. And yep. to your point, like you're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel to say, mm-hmm. Hey, this is, this law is about this specific thing. And it's like, no, you, you don't understand. There's actually a broader it's nature bigger. here. It's way yeah. Yeah. The, the, the yeah. plank and splinter illustration. Mm-hmm. Now you, you mentioned a couple of times, uh, first, second, third law in the list here. In your book, you talk about the debate or difficulty in numbering the laws, which, uh, pardon my ignorance, didn't even realize was a debate. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you catch us up on the debate of yeah. numbering the Ten Commandments? Sure, and, and, yeah. And, and to that we point, really like the round number 10. I love it, round number 10. <laughs> and I also, I loved the illustration that you gave of show me your sanctuary and I'll show you how you number the commandments. So, so maybe, mm-hmm. maybe uh, uh, explain that as well. Sure. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised when I started my doctoral work and discovered that it wasn't obvious how to count the Ten Commandments. Um, And different church traditions, different religious traditions, including Jewish, have have numbered them in different ways. There's even in the Hebrew Bible, the accent system preserves two different ways of counting them. Like you can see the accents are added in to show you where, where they start and stop. And there's two competing systems of accents, even in the Hebrew Bible. So this is a really old debate. Um, But what I found fascinating is that Catholics, um, I'll I'll just use Catholic and Reformed as kind of the two two main camps, but lots of denominations obviously fall fall under those headings. Um, Catholics count the command against um, worshiping other gods. They count with that the command not to make idols or images. So they're reading the command against um, making images as images of other gods. 
So you'll you'll find if you walk into a Catholic sanctuary, you'll find a crucifix with Jesus hanging on it. You'll find images of Jesus and images even in in um, Catholic tradition, even icons that picture the Trinity. So picturing even the Father and the Spirit as well as Jesus. And they don't feel that that's a violation of the Ten Commandments because the command not to make idols is part of the command not to have other gods. And they're not having another god. They're worshiping Yahweh, the one true God. So that's really interesting. The Reformed tradition separated the command against making images into a separate command as a way of the, the way they read it, the way they emphasize is that um, is that you're not to have other gods. So you don't worship other gods, but you also don't make any images of Yahweh. And so if you walk into a Reformed church, you're not going to see pictures of God around. You're not going to see icons. Um, in fact, growing up, my uh, when, when my grandma found out that I wanted to buy a nativity scene, she was horrified because that's an image, you know, that's Jesus in the manger, that's an image of God. And she thought I was breaking the Ten Commandments. Right. Right. Go ahead. No, go for it. No, okay, so uh, uh, the... The, the layering of the Ten Commandments, uh, this is kind of a follow-up question to that. Many yeah. have suggested that the Ten Commandments, because they were written in stone, have somehow have higher value or are more mm. important than the other commandments. Uh, mm. how, would we, how would we approach uh, God's law? And in talking about that, we'll probably follow up with a Sabbath question uh, sure. and talking about the Ten Commandments, if they are, in fact, moral, if they are uh, kind of a creation uh, for all mm -hmm. people. Uh, but, but, but help us understand, what's the difference between uh, the commandments that are written in stone tablets versus uh, commandments that are written on yeah. papyrus? That's a, that's a great question. I would say that the stone tablets primarily signal that Israel is entering into a treaty with Yahweh. They're, they're entering into a covenant, and every covenant had stone tablets. I even have mine here, uh, here with me, so I've got two rocks I carry with me to class here to, to symbolize. Um, one thing I talk to my students about is that the, we don't have two tablets because they didn't all fit on one. We have two tablets because of every treaty had duplicate copies. It was made in, in two copies. Mm. And so I, um, these are important. They're the stipulations of Israel's covenant. I would call them the seed out of which, from which the rest of the law flows. So the, the rest of the laws usually relate somehow to these 10. Um, they're more specific instances of them or extrapolations in different areas of life. But I would not say that the Ten Commandments are a universal moral law or a universal moral code that applies to everybody at all time. They are not timeless, they are not universal, and they don't apply to everybody. And we can see that most specifically with the command not to bear Yahweh's name in vain, because only the covenant people bear Yahweh's name. It is impossible for someone who doesn't belong to God to misrepresent him. He, they don't... Right. They're not name bearers. And so I would say that the Ten Commandments are specific for the covenant people, that they are generative of the other laws. Um, and I, maybe I would just add to that, um, because I didn't say it earlier and probably should have, our pathway into this covenant as Gentile believers in Jesus, I think is most clear in First Peter chapter 2. Verses 9 and 10. This is the passage that I wrote my master's thesis on at Gordon-Conwell. Um, let me just pull it up a minute. So you asked earlier about um, Christians' relationship to the Old Testament law, and this is where it became really clear to me. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, he says, and, and I would say Peter is writing to a mixed audience, of both Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus who are scattered throughout the Roman world. And he says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. And, and then he goes on to say what the purpose is, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Those titles that he just slapped on his audience are Sinai titles. Those come from Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where Moses has just brought his pe people, the people out of Egypt and to the mountain. And before they get any commands, 
Yahweh appears and speaks to the people, and he calls them his treasured possession, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is their vocation. And now Peter is inviting all followers of Jesus into this vocation as representatives of Yahweh. Yeah, okay. Awesome. So uh, I, I love that. So l- let's talk about that a little bit more and what it and and continue just flowing into what this looks like as a New Testament, New Covenant mm-hmm. believer. Uh, maybe we can even uh, speak of that sort of gateway moment of of the Christian when we uh, mm-hmm. when we enter into baptism. We are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the name. Yeah. And yeah. hearing you speak so much about bearing the name, bearing the name, bearing the name. Mm-hmm dating back to the Old Testament, I just have a feeling there's just going to be a richness around yeah. this uh, concept of being baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, there is a richness there, and I think it's really profound that um, God is God is inviting people, as, as people are baptized, they are being stamped with God's name. And I, I believe that's why Jesus says to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's, he's acknowledging the whole Trinity. You're now bearing the name of the Trinity as a believer. Um, there's another passage that came to mind that connects with this, which I think is so cool. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 13 it said, it, this is this long pa- passage, long, like really long sentence of Paul, I think that goes on from th- three through, at least three through 10, talking about us being chosen, actually us being the Jews chosen, and then Gentiles were cho- chosen as well. Verse 13, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. I think when I was growing up, every time I read this passage, and I read it many times, I was thinking of seal like you seal an envelope shut, and so it can't Mm -hmm. be opened. Like we're somehow like protected and kept for all time. But now that I've studied this concept of bearing the name, and I've done studies on seals in ancient times, this is not like seal the animal you see at the zoo or at the coast. And This is a seal like, and it's not like seal like you seal an envelope shut. In ancient times, people would wear, especially wealthy people or leaders, would have a signet ring on which their name was inscribed. And they would stamp that that. It was like a stamp that they could press into wax or into clay to, sh- to show their signature on something. And so when it says you were marked in him with a seal, this is not- none other than the Holy Spirit is marking us with God's name. The Holy Spirit is the proof that we belong to God, that we bear his name. And so seal should, in our minds, automatically make us think of God's name. And that's happening at the moment of salvation. Baptism is a sign of that being baptized in the name. And so therefore, let those who are baptized not bear his name in vain. You can see this in some of the early church fathers as they're writing. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but in the apostolic fathers, there's several writers who talk about baptism um, as the moment of receiving the name, and then you better not bear it in vain. So they are Mm. thinking of baptism in terms of this command, and they are reading the command as if it's uh, bearing God's name, not you know, oath taking. That's great. Hey, so, you know, it, 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 kind of piggybacking off of his question, there's this entry mm-hmm. point in which Christians come into saving faith by bearing God's name in baptism. And we had yeah. talked just prior about the, the Ten Commandments and these laws uh, that, mm-hmm. that, that, in fact, do that so that we can bear yeah. Christ's name. What about Sabbath? And I think that we can probably yeah. do two of these at once. Um, uh, same per- Kiss the Sun uh, commenting in here, uh, ask, not necessarily ask the question, but is uncomfortable with the phraseology of we must do this or mm-hmm. we must do that. Mm. Doesn't the the language of must imply um, sin? If, if you don't do it, you're sinful. If you do do it, uh, then you're in right standing before God. Uh, so so maybe both of those questions, yeah. Sabbath, okay. and how do we look at it, is a must or optional in, in receiving that blessing? Okay, so let me start with the must. Um, when we go back to the Old Testament, again, Israel is not is not obeying the law to earn their salvation. They're already redeemed when they get it. However, when they fail to bear God's name well, there is punishment involved, and it does 
it does profane God's name. So the, the key chapter that's in my that's coming to my mind is Ezekiel 36, which in which Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, is describing what happened to God's reputation when Israel went into exile. So, so although they're not earning their salvation by doing the law, they are positioning themselves for God's blessing when they do the law. And they're disqualifying themselves from blessing when they don't obey the law because it results, you know, they lose their time in the land. They lose their tenure in the land by not keeping the covenant. And God says, I'm going to bring you back to the land, actually not because you deserve it, but because I need to set the record straight about my power and who I am. I need to sanctify my name because you profaned it by going into exile. So so as far as must goes, yes, as Christians, when we fail to walk honor honorably with God, we are sinning. We don't lose our salvation over that, but there are un- Un, uh, what's the what's the word I want? Unpleasant consequences for when we fail to to keep covenant. Now Jesus' blood covers our sin. It's, we're not losing our eternal standing. The covenant isn't off, but we're we position ourselves to be in right relationship with God by living well and bearing His name well. Now Sabbath okay. is the example that you brought up. Sabbath is a funny one because it's the one that most of my students think, okay, so like all the 10 commandments still apply but not that one, right? Right. Because right. that would be legalistic if we did that one. It, what's really funny to me about Sabbath is like it's the it's like the best gift. So God is saying to his people, <laughs> you were slaves in Egypt, you worked 24/7 for somebody else. But now in my kingdom, I want you to take a day off every week. I don't want you to work like the whole world depends on you. I want you to stop one day a week and rest in my provision and trust that I can provide for you. And we say, oh, no, no, we shouldn't do that. That's legalistic. Like, really? You want to spend your whole life on a hamster wheel? You never want to take a rest? I think this is the most amazing gift God is giving his people. He says, you used to be slaves. You're not slaves anymore. I don't want you to live like slaves anymore. I want you to get a break. And I think... To, to practice the Sabbath is to lean into our humanness and our dependence on God. So do I keep it in a legalistic way? No. I mean, like, I think, I think we can all think of examples of people who kept the Sabbath in really legalistic ways, and it made them sourpusses. That's not what I'm suggesting that we do. But I, ha- I am suggesting that we embrace Sabbath as a gift and that we look at ways to take one day a week where we unplug and stop, you know, we get off the hamster wheel and stop living as if everything depends on us. Mm, Amen. It's great. Love it. Okay. um, I want to come back to one of the differences you pointed out earlier between the kind of old covenant, new covenant, that discontinuity. Okay. And, uh, and if I understand you right, it, it sounded to me like the primary distinction was not so much necessarily the content. Yes, there's some content difference, but it, it seemed like especially it was on our end in our hearts, hmm. the work of God in our hearts. Did I understand you rightly? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Like okay, the spirit so is could you, with us. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Could you speak into that? Like what is, so I heard you just now say the spirit enabling us. Uh, okay. So there's the spirit enabling us. How does the new birth play into all of that? So can you speak into Holy Spirit, new birth? Um, yeah, how that plays in? Um, I would say the new birth is our, our being born into the family of God, which is a covenant family. So we're now part mm-hmm. of God's household, um, which is what he's, he's at Sinai. He's setting up like how to, how do we run this household? Like, how can we have a smooth running household? And so new birth is partly just um, leaning into a new identity that we have as children of God who participate in his work in the world, not out of obligation, but out of joy. God set us free. And so now we joyfully live as his children. Um, I guess that's how I would think of new birth. Okay. And then the Spirit's role. What's this, uh, How would you characterize the difference in Old Covenant, New Covenant, the role of the Spirit? Mm. What makes us new on the inside? Yeah, I think um, what's wh- one difference I've heard people talk about is that in the New Testament, after Christ's ascension, we have the democratization of the Spirit. So while the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament and he came on various individuals to empower them for certain tasks, in Christ we're sealed with the Spirit. So the Spirit is a 
is a gift guaranteeing our inheritance and he stays with us, continues to guide us, continues to show us creative ways to serve God, to live out our vocation as name bearers. He can, he, um, he pricks our consciences, you know, speaks to us, convicts us when we're not living well. So very, very active role. It's not, it's not as though it's all up to us to be perfect. Like the spirit is empowering and enabling us to think of creative ways of being God's people in our particular context. That's great. Hey, Carmen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an honor to have you. I'd love Thanks. to have you back on in the near oh. future since Corona has shut everything down. We might yeah. uh, schedule something here. Uh, I think that'd be fun. Uh, so for those of you who are watching, and this is like really fascinating content for you, I would encourage you uh, the next next week, just next week, uh, we have John Bunn who has done a stream. Uh, we've recorded, a, not a stream, we've recorded an episode on Passover. He's come in, mm -hmm. he's done the Passover meal and, and showing, look, this is pointing to Christ. This is representative of Christ. That That's mm -hmm. representative of the Trinity and, and these how, how sin is removed from us, where Judas was uh, uh, during, uh, the, I think it was the Cup of Wrath. I, I forget how it, how it goes down with the uh, in the meal. But if you want to learn a little bit more about kind of uh, the law and how we see Christ in the midst of all of that, uh, Passover mm -hmm. would be a good one to watch in the Sabbath. We filmed an episode on Sabbath observance, and we talked about kind of the three or four different views of Sabbath, uh, not necessarily coming down real hard on this is correct, this is incorrect, uh, but but just dialoguing about the different views of Sabbath observance that are out there. We filmed that one with Dawson, who functions as our researcher here on the show, so we're getting him involved a little bit more with taping content, so super thrilled to do that kind of stuff. Let's do some closing thoughts, Carmen. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get some of your thoughts of, man, what do you want people to walk away with? Michael, mm -hmm. maybe we'll start with you, and then we'll toss it over to Carmen. What, what are the kind of main takeaways? Takeaways you want people to walk away from this episode with? Okay, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, a couple things. I think for me, one, the continuity between Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. I I think that's important because it's it, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and mm -hmm. forever. And just and seeing that it wasn't big bad mean God of the old. Old Testament who gave you this terrible covenant. Mm -hmm. This was actually like a privilege and a joy and a grace. Yes. I do believe we have a greater grace in the new covenant because we have mm -hmm. a revelation of the Son of God. We have something yes. prophets longed to see. Yeah. However, there is a continuity that is understated in modern, modern Christendom. I think that's the first thing. The mm -hmm. second thing, I just the concept of bearing God's name, and Carmen, this is a word I, I heard you uh, say over and over again, was this word vocation, that mm -hmm. it's not enough for me to just like, hey, my job as Christian is just be nice and help grandma across the street and just try not mm -hmm. to be too bad of a person now, but actually mm -hmm. this vocation where in bearing God's name, I'm representing him yeah, throughout the earth. This mm -hmm. is a privilege to be his light in the world. And so it's it's kind of like taking it a step further beyond just be a nice, good church-going Christian mm -hmm. to how can I proactively bear God's name out in the world and, and, and be the answer to the Lord's prayer, hallowed be your name. So I think that would be mine. <laughs> Carmen, what, what's some closing thoughts for you? Yeah, I think the thing that I, that I really hope readers will take away from my book is just a rediscovery of the value of the Old Testament. It's worth reading. It's full of life. Um, it, it shows us the, the majesty of God, but also his love and mercy. People tend to think of wrath in the Old Testament and grace in the New Testament. That's not how I see it. So if you've ever had trouble finding God's grace in the Old Testament, read the book, and I hope to help guide you through it so that you can see it's right there. Um, I, I hope that Christians rediscover, as Michael just said, their vocation. I don't think that Christians can know who they are and what they're called to be and do in the world without reckoning with Sinai, without coming back to Sinai mm. and seeing how God is calling his people into existence and calling them to bless the nations. And I think we we sell ourselves short, we, we cut short the process by just reading the New Testament and expecting it to make sense without this really rich background. I, I, what, I would also like to say one word to anybody out there who's come from a strongly legalistic background. Maybe there's somebody listening who feels like they just came out of a really restrictive church environment that you would maybe even call spiritually abusive. 
And now, and now I'm on here saying that we should obey the laws at Sinai. And you're feeling like that would be to go back into chains again. And you were just discovering freedom in Christ. Um, this podcast probably wasn't for you. I hope there comes a day when you can go back to the Old Testament and see the grace there. But probably you need some time to just sit with Jesus and sit in the grace of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the freedom of the Spirit. And and Sinai, maybe you would have a hard time hearing it the way I want you to hear it. It's not a ball and chain. I'm not advocating that we earn our salvation. I really want people to to see that Christ is is all is he's all things. He's the one who fulfills the law. He's the one who calls us into this vocation. Um, we're not we're not interested in Sinai because we're earning anything. It's just part of learning to live as his people. So that's, I think that's the word I'd leave with. Amen. That was great. That was very pastoral. Thank that you for that word. That was very pastoral. Um, just guys, pick up this book. Uh, a link in the description. Amazon right now is not shipping because of Corona time, uh, but we will go ahead and put you in the uh, the description both the Amazon link, which won't be shipping now, but if you're watching this two months from now, mm-hmm. pray mm-hmm. to God that Amazon is shipping books by then. <laughs> and then uh, we're also going to put, I think you said InterVarsity Press is yeah. the link that we would, is that right? Yep, that's right. Great. Yeah, cool. I, I'm hearing you out of the corner of my ear. The speaker's over here making I'm sure. I'm a that Kindle I, I guy, though. Correct. I'm oh, yeah. all about the Kindle. Oh, yeah. Those so digital on, downloads, they'll be Kindle. available. It's on Kindle. It's also an audio book. Um, you can That's order it from it. IVP, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, Indigo Books if you're in Canada. One more thing I didn't say about the book, which I think is really cool. I have a section in the back where I give QR codes for videos from the Bible Project that go with mm-hmm. each chapter. So if you want to read Great. through the book with a small group, there's discussion questions and there's links to Bible Project videos that will help kind of make it work for a small group setting. That's super cool. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an honor yeah. to have you. Like I said, we'd love to have you back on. Uh, for those of you who are watching uh, Remnant Radio's The Theology Broadcast, we broadcast every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Because of Corona, we're coming out with more episodes every week. We're doing like three, maybe four episodes a week, just depending on how things go down. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button. There's actually a bell notification where you can get all notifications, which would be helpful during the season. You maybe you can turn it off later if we're, you know, content overload. But uh, it's going to be great <laughs> stuff coming down the pipe. We have Dr. Michael Heiser coming on next week. I've got Matthew, or no, not next week, tomorrow, Dr. Heiser's coming on. Monday, uh, we have uh, Esquivel talking about uh, 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 contemplative prayer and other episodes that I would love to mention, but because of short-term memory, uh, I will choose <laughs> not to put my foot in my mouth. So yeah. uh, good stuff. Thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we'll see you guys yeah. next time. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Blessings. Blessings.